Good evening. Uh, please remember the, the new schedule is 8 o'clock. I forgot to tell them that, so they opened the place a little bit late today. Next week will be on time, Blaise Ratoshim. We are uh, before Parashat uh, Vayera. Yesterday I spoke about it for two hours in Queens. Today we'll speak about it for two hours here, uh, for the parts that I didn't get to speak about. Uh, the story of Avraham Avinu, there are three parashiyot, Lech Lecha, Vayera, Chayei Sara, speaks about Avraham Avinu, the founder of monotheism, the, the first father out of three, that was accepted by three main religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They just pronounced his name a little bit different, Ibrahim or Abraham, but it's the same person. And uh, one of the things we learn from, there's few things that we can learn from his life, many things, a few main, major things that we can learn from the life of Abraham Avinu. One thing is, we know for sure that he was loved by Hashem very much. Hashem loved him very much. How do we know? It's written. It's written in the Torah. It's written, I love Abraham because I know he passed my Torah to his children. So with one verse, you cannot argue. It's, it appears twice in the Torah that Hashem loves him. And then one more time, as you can see in this parasha, before Hashem came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he felt that he must inform Avraham Avinu before he actually starts to destroy them. He has to first speak to him and explain to him that this is what's about to happen, that he doesn't want him to be surprised. So what do we learn from here? You know, you have to be clever. When you read the Torah, it's a divine book. So that means when you read in between the lines, you learn slowly, slowly the opinion of God about us. The opinion is the same opinion. It's not based on moods like people. One day he listened to this talk show, his opinion is right. The next day he listened to the liberal, the next day is pro Hamas. Two minutes later he heard somebody from Kahana, oh, we gotta take care of them. Two minutes later Obama gave a speech, Psh, liberal again. Every day according to the mood. With Hashem it's not like that, Baruch Hashem. What he likes, it's always the same. What he hates, it's always the same. What he cannot stand is always the same. If he hated proud people then, he hates them now. If he loved humble people to, back then, he loves them now. He hates lack of modesty, that doesn't change. Still hate it. Nothing will ever change, because with Hashem is perfect, remember. People, their opinions are influenced by certain things that happens around them. The way they're brought up, the way they taught them in school, the opinion of the father, the opinion of uh, a movie star that he's following. Many, many things gather together to influence the human being in his lifetime with his opinions. Sometimes we see the older the person becomes, his opinions change with the age. Sometimes he was too strict when he was young, jump to conclusion, not experience in life. When he gets older and older, He's more conservative, you know, he's thinking more, he's not jumping, he's not radical. Why? The age calm down the person. But Hashem is the same Hashem. It's, it's written, in case that you have a, a doubt about it, Ani Hashem lo shaniti. Same way I am God, never changed. Same God I always been. That's how the nation of Israel will never be destroyed from the face of the earth and my covenant with them will remain forever. So we learn from Avraham Avinu that when Hashem is happy from you, He cares about your feelings. He cares. He comes and he, he wants to inform Avraham Avinu that he is not getting shocked. Big deal. So Avraham will get shocked. Ma, what's the big deal? Anyway, it's nothing to do with Sodom and Gomorrah right now. It's his nephew. You want to save his nephew? Save his nephew. And by the time the nephew is out of Sodom, arrange for him to go to a different city and then destroy them. There's different ways. No. 
I, if someone is faithful to me, is very special for me. Very, very special for me. So instead of running to all kinds of Babas and Kabbalists to give them tons of money that things will work well in your life, make some adjustment and you're going to get to a very high level without them. You don't need middlemen. All you have to do is to do what Hashem wants you to do and you're good. And things starting to look much better. Same thing Noach. Noach matzachen be'enei Hashem. Noach found favor in the eyes of God. It's not just a sentence here. From so many millions of people, he was the only one that Hashem actually liked. Also, his son Shem was also tzaddik, but he was the main one. Noach matzachen be'enei Hashem. So what else we can learn from Avraham Avinu? That in Avraham Avinu, Hashem first consulted with him and told him that he's about to do what he did. Right away, he started to fight for the justice. He started to fight for the justice. Some people think that Avraham Avinu, he was fighting for the wicked people to try to save them. Is it true? The answer, absolutely not. Read clearly the verses. Why people twist the truth of the Torah for their own convenience and agenda? Why? That's not what the Torah says. The Torah says that Abraham started a dialogue with Hashem, just like in a courtroom. He said to Hashem, you the master of the land, the judge, the fair judge, you kill the righteous with the wicked, is that justice? So who is he care for? He cares for the righteous. He doesn't care about the wicked. If his argument was to save the wicked people, he should have come from with a different approach. He should say, Hashem, there's millions of people over there until you finally created them, until they build all these cities. It took thousands and who knows how many hours to build every building and this and that. And now you're going to destroy everything. Maybe you do something in the world that these people will do tshuva. Nothing like this. Abraham didn't speak for them. He only cared about the few tzaddikim that they may have in San Francisco or in Manhattan. You know, so he said, maybe there's few tzaddikim over there. Are you going to kill them with the, with the wicked? So Hashem told him, there's no 50 tzaddikim. And then no 45, no, no 40, no 30, no 20, no 10. No 10 tzaddikim in five major cities. Sodom is the center of all business. Then you have uh, the other ones, Bela, Mitzar, uh, Amora, all these cities, they're all secondary to Saddam. It's like Manhattan and the other four, four bar, 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 bureaus. But Manhattan is the main thing. When they say New York City, that's what they mean. Same thing, Saddam is like the New York City of those days, or the Las Vegas of that days. So what happened now? After all the conversation that they had, Hashem say to, to Avraham, there's really no ten. Rav Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, was a very big Ashkenazi Chacham, he writes in his Perush of the Torah, he has wonderful Perush on the Torah, which is very popular, and he writes, En Avraham Avinu mevakesh kan rachamim leman chamishim tzadikim amitgorerim bemikre besdom. After I clarified that Avram for sure did not argue for the sake of the wicked people, because it's written that when the wicked people get destroyed, it's a celebration to the world. That's not a problem. Not every death in the world is a tragedy. Depend who the person that died. If Saddam Hussein died, it's not a tragedy for the world. If one of these Hamas terrorists dies, it's a celebration for the world. It's not a tragedy. But when a big tzaddik, somebody or a little kid dies, it's a tragedy to the world, of course. So after we see that it's written, Be'avod reshaim rina, when the wicked people get destroyed, it's a celebration for the world. Or that it's written, Mesanecha Hashem esna, all the people that hate you, God, automatically I hate them, because obviously I cannot side with them against you. There's hundreds of other psukim in the Tanakh that leaves no doubt that the wicked people, there's no mitzvah to love them, and it's not included bichlal amitecha. It's written in the Torah, Ocheach tochiach et amitecha, o ve'ahavta l'reacha kamocha. The Torah is very precise. 
The Torah did not say you should love every Jew like you love yourself. No. And the Torah did not say to go and, and give tochecha, to be mochiach, every Jew. It didn't say that. It says, amitecha, achicha, reacha. What does it mean? Someone that is in your side. Someone is an atheist, make fun at Hashem and at the Torah. It's a clown. You don't have obligation with him. Someone that is mistaken, true that someone misled him, told him the wrong way. It's a very big mitzvah to go and get him out of there and save him, of course. But someone that made his life as a, he has a mission to destroy Judaism, to destroy Torah, to destroy the rabbis, to destroy someone like this, you have time to give him tochecha? He cares about tochecha? He cares to destroy it. Somebody like this, you have obligation to love like you love yourself? Someone that spits in the Torah and makes all kinds of Jews go off the derech. You have an obligation to love him? Yes, if you're a fool, yes. Do you really think Hashem wants you to love this monster just like you love yourself? What, do you, what does it mean? To die for him just like you would die for yourself? Of course not. Don't be naive and don't be foolish. Also what it says, Chayav Adam Ladun Kol Adam Lekav Schut, it's also incorrect. You have to be careful with that. That's not the law. What, what does it mean, Ladun Adam Lekav Schut? Kav Schut means when a person did something and it looks like a sin. It looks bad. Now you have to give him the benefits of the doubt. That he, there was no other way, and he didn't mean it was an accident, all kinds of things to clean him in a judgment, clean him. Now, when is it correct? If a person known as a Shomer Shabbat, everybody knows he's already at least for months, he's keeping Shabbat, he comes to shul, everyone sees that he doesn't drive a car, and then all of a sudden after six months that you know he's a Shomer Shabbat or whatever, you found him in a car driving in Shabbat. Driving in Shabbat, so, what do you have to say right away? Wow, I wonder what happened that he needs to go to the hospital. You have to judge him to the favor side. Why? Obviously, there's an accident or a tragedy, or maybe his wife has to give birth, or maybe he's running to save life of a person that just called him. It had to be something. You have to actually believe 100% that this person is not breaking Shabbat, is actually is busy with mitzvah right now. But if it's a person that is known that all the time he drives on Shabbat, every Shabbat is mechalel, and now you see him driving in a car, oh, here is Moshe driving the car on Shabbat. So what, you have to give him the benefits of the doubt that he's not mechalel Shabbat? What, are you normal? Who would, be, who would expect from you such silly thing? Of course it's mechalel Shabbat. We know for years it's mechalel Shabbat. Or if someone knows him as a big thief, Everyone who ever did business with him reported that he cheated him and stole from him and everything. And then he came to your house and something is missing. There was a few other people over there. You have to say, this is the guy that stole it. Ah, you don't have evidence. Doesn't matter. When the police come, they ask you, do you suspect anyone? You say, yeah, this guy. Why? It's Motsi Shemra. If the Jew is innocent and he has a kosher reputation, you're not allowed to say to the cop, yeah, I suspect him just because maybe you went to the bathroom and it's close to your bedroom. No. You cannot just suspect people even if they were nearby or whatever. No. Only you're allowed to suspect them if they already have a record. Someone was caught three, four times and everyone knows he's been doing it again and again and again. Next time it happens, it's him. Now he has the burden of proof to prove that it wasn't him. But chazaka, certainty, it's him. Why not to give him the benefits of the doubt? Because he has chazaka of a non-kosher person. Someone eats treif in every non-kosher restaurant. And now you see him tomorrow in another non-kosher restaurant. What are you going to say? Oh, probably he made a mistake. He didn't know it's non-kosher. The Torah did not commend the Jews to be stupid. That's not an obligation in a taryag mitzvot. The Torah say to be righteous, to, to go by justice. Just when you know if your reputation is clean, you don't want someone to wound your reputation with false accusation, right? But if you know you're a big thief, 
and someone is blaming you, be quiet. Just be quiet. Why? Because you know he's right. Don't make it worse. But if you're not like that, then of course you have the right to defend yourself. But if you know what he say about you, it's true, all you have to do is to make tshuva and to regret that you got to that situation. But how many people are like that? How many people would side with the attacker knowing they're right and be silent? And when they say, why you don't answer him back? It doesn't matter, I rather not answer. Why? He knows he's right. Everything he say about him is true. Person knows if it's true or not. Somebody calls you a thief. You're the only one in the world besides Hashem that know how much you stole or didn't. You know it. So if someone calls you a thief, then you are, so why the thieves are always arguing back that they're innocent? Everyone in jail claim is innocent. Why? Why people fight back? Did you ever see someone that says, right, I'm a thief. <coughs> He's right, I'm a crook. He's right, I'm this. He's right, I'm a murderer. Did you ever see such thing? It's hardly ever. There are two reasons for it. One, the person knows he's a thief, but he also knows that the person that blames him doesn't know it for sure. He doesn't have enough evidence. So that's, that's kill him. How does he dare to blame me based on assumption? So he fights back. Not because he's not like that. Accidentally, he was pointing to the right target. But that doesn't mean he knew. Unless if he's a policeman, an FBI investigator, and he has the, all the proofs, that's a different story. Then they admit, because they know, that's it, he knows. They, by then they know. So, the only one that we can read about that was fair enough is David Amelech, King David. Why, when Shaul was chasing him, King Saul was chasing David Amelech. He was hiding, running away from one place to another. So what did he say to Hashem? One of them is Morim in Tehilim. I'm sure you read it back, in, you know, at least once in your life. He said to Hashem, if I'm guilty and Shaul is right, make sure he finds me, catch me, kill me, make me dirt on the floor. You know, do you ever hear such thing? A person is a fugitive. He's running away from someone that wants to kill him with his soldiers. And he's praying, Hashem, I'm begging you, if I deserve it, if, it's, if they're right about their claims, make sure they catch me and kill me and cut me to pieces. When did you ever see a person that has such a midat emet, such a level of honesty? I don't want to leave if I don't deserve to leave. I don't want to live just to live. He, he prays to Hashem, please, if I deserve to die, do it. Give me what I deserve. Most people not like that. Everyone spare his own life. People turn to spare their own life or their children's life, but they don't care about other people's life. How a person get angry when someone destroyed him and bash him on, on the public, and then a minute later he does it to someone else and doesn't feel the difference. Because now it's not him, someone else, who cares? So Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch now comes with another explanation. After now we understand that Avraham Avinu did not pray for the Reshaim. He can care less if they all get killed. He only worry about the tzaddikim that lives there, that they won't die with them. Why Avraham is worried? He didn't trust Hashem. Avraham did not trust Hashem that he will save the ones who deserve to get saved. The answer is, Avraham knew there's a rule, oi la rasha ve oi le shcheno. Oi to the wicked and oi to his neighbor. Once the bomb falls on the house of the wicked, his neighbor dies with him. But the neighbor is a tzaddik, it's not rasha. He goes to shul, ma. He eats kosher, his kitchen is kosher. He has no television at home. He has a lot of Torah books. Why would he die with a rasha? that lives just because he lives next to him on the block? The answer is because when a person come to live among the wicked people, surrounded with wicked, that's a sign that in a way he himself is wicked. Even though he keeps the laws, very nice of him, but his ideology is not good. Why is not good? Because a real righteous person 
cannot stand standing one minute next to the wicked people. Forget about living with them in a neighborhood and, and sharing the same backyard and have to see their face every day. No. If your soul is purified from Torah and Irat Shamayim, as soon as you see somebody like this, the way he dress, the way he talks, the way he cares, the things that he does in his house or outside of the house, and, and you see him on Shabbat, and you're complete opposite of him, and you still want to be his neighbor, like everything is fine, and he comes to your living room, and you eat with him, and everything is fine. That means something in you is not pure, because it's against the law of nature. The law of nature is a pure soul cannot be attached to an impure soul. And tahor nidbak betameh. That's the answer of Abraham Avinu to his servant, Eliezer Eved Avram. Eliezer Eved Knaani is the servant of Avram Avinu. Did you know that he's one of the only ten people in the history that made it to Olam Abba with his body? Goy, Nanju, Eliezer Eved Avram. Everything Avram knew, he learned from Avram. He was so faithful, so honest. Amazing. Based on what we read about Eliezer Eved Avram, we wish to be in his level of irat shamayim and honesty. And yet, when Avram said to him, I want you to swear to me that you're not going to get a, a wife for my son from the Knaaniot, go to the house of my family, Lavan, Betuel, get a wife from there. Don't get from the Knaanim. So Eliezer had all his life a dream that his daughter would marry Yitzchak. Why? He's not a regular servant that wash the dishes and clean. No. He's in charge of Meshek Bait. He's, an, he's basically in charge of all the workers. He only tells them what to do. You know, when you have a big mansion, there's a lot of servants. Not all of them equal. There's one that is the boss of all of them, because the real master doesn't have time to give them instructions. So you find one, you do the laundry, you cut the grass, you clean, you take the garbage out, you go to the supermarket. He only gives them instruction. He wear a suit. I've been in some houses like this. I've been in some houses of people like this. There are many, many servants, many uh, huge homes, like the size of hotel, and they give instruction. You do this, you do that, and he's in charge of everything. He doesn't dealt his hand. This is the way he was. It's not just a, 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 a little low life that gets instruction like a slave. No. And he's in a very high level. He's, he's risking his life for Avram Avinu. He goes on a war to save Lot. He's willing to die for Avram. Isn't it natural that Avram will take his son and marry him to his daughter after he was so good to him and faithful to him? So Avram told him, "En baruch nidbak be'arur." A blessed, a blessed one cannot get together with a cursed one. What does it mean, cursed one? Knan in Parashat Noach we learn that Knan was the son of who? Of Ham. Ham made his father Noach. He casterized him. Why? Because he said, my father already has three sons. If he will continue to have children, we have 30 or 40 brothers. One day when he die, my share in the inheritance will be very small. Now he's drunk. He's laying there in his bed. Let me do something to him that will be unable to ever have more kids. Then when Noah opened up his eyes, the Torah said, Vaikatz Noah, Vayaret Asher Asalo Bno. Noah woke up and he saw what his son did to him. How? There was no camera. He didn't go to the computer and check the recording while I was drunk what happened in my room. Obviously, something happened in his body. He looked at himself and he saw something is different. So what happened right away? Noah said, Arur Knan. Ham was the one who did it. And he cares Knan. Who is Knan? The fourth son of Ham. Ham had four sons. Four sons he had. One of them was Kush. The word Kushi in Hebrew means black. Why black call Kushim? Even though the ignorant Israelis, they think that Kushi is a bad word. It's not a bad word. It's a word of the Torah. This is how God called them. The nation of Kush. There used to be a person named Kush. All his children called Kushim. Like Levi, Leviim. Kohen, Kohanim. Kush, Kushim. 
Nothing different. But one ignorant decided that it's racism. Now you're not allowed to say kushi in Israel. You have to say shchorim, blacks, or African American, like in America. You understand? So what happened? We had one son kush, one son put, one son Mitzrayim, and the fourth son was Knan. Each one of them became a nation. Because it was the beginning of the world after the flood. So what happened? So Knaan was the one who gave the advice to his father Ham. Look with grandpa what's going on. He brought him in and he did what he did. And Noah cursed his fourth son, meaning you made me unable to have a fourth son. I'm cursing your fourth son, Knaan. Arur Knan Eved Avadim Yelechav. Knan is cursed, will always be slaves for the rest of their life. Always be slaves. Today, who is Knan in the world? Back in the time, you had in Africa, the African blacks, they brought them to America to be slaves. No, so they were slaves. Today, who is Knan? You don't know. Why you don't know? There's no nation Knan today. All the descendants of Knaanim, they still curse until today. Nothing has ever changed. Once in a Torah you have a curse about a race, the curse remains forever. Once it say Arur for the snake, the snake is cursed forever. The only one that is cursed temporarily, meaning he can get out of the curse, is an individual human being that right now made some sins that put him in a category of Arur. As soon as he does tshuva, the Arur goes away and he goes into the Baruch. For instance, it says in the Torah, Arur, Maker Eehu Baseter. Someone that hit his friend in hidden place. Literally, what it means, literally, it means that you have a friend, you want to hit him, and you don't want to hit him in front of people. So you wait until he goes to an alley somewhere, no one is there, you come with a stick and you hit him. That's what it means literally. Why are you doing, are you doing it hiddenly? But really what it means is Lashon Ara behind your back. That's what it really means. You see, you need the oral Torah to understand what Hashem meant. Without that, it's hard to translate the Torah. If you try to translate it literally, not always makes sense. So what does it mean? Arur maker eu baseter. That's what people do all day on the internet. Make writing comments. Writing comments, he's like this, he's like that, he's, I know about this. Stop making lies. That's called maker eu baseter. Now what happened if he fixed the sin? He apologized, he published that it was a lie, forgive me, all the information wasn't true. And he come and he apologized and his friend forgave him and they hugged. Immediately he goes from a category of Arur to a category of Baruch. Why? He did tshuva. That's it. He's not guilty anymore. If he dies now, they don't talk to him about that sin. It's deleted from his file. So when a person is wicked, he's cursed. Arur. Arur asher lo yakim et divrei Torah azot ve'amar kol ha'am amen. It's written in the curses. Ve'amar kol ha'am amen. But if he gets out of it, he becomes baruch. This is very interesting. You see, animals when they're born, they're either born pure or they're born not pure. And that's how they remain for the rest of their life. For instance, if it's a pig, it's not kosher. He's born impure and will die impure. Dog, same thing. Donkey, same thing. Whore, same thing. Monkey, same thing. Cat, same thing. Sheep, goat, deer, giraffe, cow. All of them pure animals, according to the laws of the Torah. Kosher animals mean make them pure. They will remain pure for the rest of their life. Animals don't go up and down in their spiritual level, ever. If they're born in a negative spiritual level, they remain like that forever. If they're born in a positive spiritual level, they remain like that forever. 
The only one that goes up and down in his spirituality is the human being. Every minute of your life, it's like a graph, like in a stock market. Go up, go down, five cents up, two cents down, four cents up, five cents down. All the time, it keeps changing. In one second, it remains the same. Constantly moving. That's the life of a person. You say, you may say, wait a minute, I think you're a little bit exaggerating. If I sit now for an hour, how did my status change? It paused. Here, I went up, then he went down, he went up a lot, then he went down a little bit, and now I'm sitting six hours snowing on a couch. So I'm staying in the same level for six hours, no? Not going down, now I'm not going up. The answer, not true. Because the rule is, your chef batel ke medami. You sit and do nothing positive in your life, you're on the way down. You sit and you think about how great Hashem is to you, you're on the way up. Same thing, sitting, sitting on your couch, thinking, I'm going to get this guy tomorrow at work. I'm going to teach him who the boss is. I'll destroy him. I'll kill him. I have, I have to see if my gun is still working. You're planning all this thing. I'll kill this guy. Every second is an avera. And you think the other way around. I'll forgive him. I'll apologize. Even though it's his fault, no problem. Why to make a war? Every second is mitzvah. So even when you see it, depends what's in your mind. You think positive, good. You think negative, good. There are six mitzvot from the Torah that it's in the mind. They're all related to emunah, to faith. If you're constantly working on them, you can make thousands of mitzvot a day doing nothing, just with your mind. For instance, if, you, if somebody gives you a ride, you drive in a car, instead of talking about all the shtuyot, you're thinking, shiviti Hashem l'negdi tamid. You look at the trees, ma'arabu ma'asecha Hashem. You look around, you look at so many wicked people, nobody has kippah, no one has tzitzit, people eat on the street like monkeys. You walk in the street, you see what's happening with the pritzud, how people dress like animals when they leave the house. And then you say, wow, I'm not like this. Thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you for giving me the right messenger to teach me what's the right way. Thank you, thank you. Every second, thank you, mitzvah. I appreciate it, mitzvah. How great is the color of the trees, mitzvah. How wonderful you are, Hashem, mitzvah. Even when you think, Hashem, I need your help. Please help me. I have a problem. I cannot rely on anyone besides you. It goes through your mind. Every second, mitzvah. Even if Hashem will not help you for whatever reason, he has all these calculations, sometimes you're asking for something that's not good for you in the long run. You don't see it. Even if Hashem chose not to help you, the fact that you rely on him every second of your life is already a constant mitzvah that is going on and on and on. And that's what a lot of people do not know. It's very hard for them to know that once once a person thinks positive, automatically it's count like mitzvah. So Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, in his Perush of the Torah, he said, Avraham Avinu is not asking for mercy for the 50 righteous people that live in San Francisco. No, that's not what he does. What does he do? He wants, he's defending the 50 righteous people that are betoch ha'ir. What does it mean betoch ha'ir? What does it mean? Ula yesh chamishim tzadikim betoch ha'ir. That's what Abraham says. Maybe there are 50 righteous people inside the city. Why does Abraham have to be so precise? Inside the city. Maybe among them there are 50 tzadikim. The answer is tzadikim ha'me'urim im anshe ha'makom. I'll explain in a second. Who did Avraham Avinu pray for? Not for regular tzaddikim. Now we're going one more, one level higher. Before, before this lecture started, most of you probably thought that Avraham Avinu is arguing to save the millions of wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now we already proved to you, based on the words of the Torah, that that wasn't the case. He only cared about the tzaddikim, but that's also not accurate. He does not care about all the tzaddikim. 
רועי צדיקים he cares about, according to רב שמשון רפאל הירש זצ"ל, only the צדיקים that try to make the wicked people בעלי תשובה. That try to bring them to the truth. Not that they live their life and they don't care that the neighbors are all מחללי שבת and they are doing all kinds of idol worshiping and stealing, etc. This is his words. Only עם אנשי המקום, או הצדיקים המעורים, מעורים מין מיקסט, with אנשי המקום, right, the people of the place, ומשתדלים להחזיר אותם למוטב, and they are trying to bring them into the right path. כי צדיק היושב בסביבה סדומית, a righteous that live in a sodomite area, meaning that behave like Sodom in Gomorrah, and or a shy lafkir at Amonea Toshavim is not allowed to neglect the people around him, the wicked people, will he stagger be Araba Amochelo and to close himself in between four walls. I don't care what's happening outside. Let's bring the shades down. I'm not coming out of my home. I have my mikveh. I have my bedroom up there. I have my books here. I don't go out to the street. Today, it's possible. You can be locked in a room all your life and influence thousands of people on the media. There are people like this. They speak to the camera. They have a shul in their house. They go down to the shul. They talk to the camera, put it on YouTube. Thousands of people become religious. They don't go out. They don't want to go. They don't want to see people. They don't want women, women that are not modest. They don't want to see all kinds of things. They say, I'm going to put it, put it online. I'll make CDs. People will give them out. I don't leave my home. Or I don't leave the yeshiva. There are people like this. But back in his time, he didn't have media like today. No television, no nothing. So he writes, Tzadik cannot ignore the public around him. Like, I save my soul, and that's what's important. He has to be inside the city to make connection with the people of the place, to improve the right way, to improve them to go to the right way, to direct them to do tshuva. Tzadik, like this, he can save the entire city. If there were tzadikim like that, also the other people can get a second chance. No, you know you deserve to die, but you're not dying. You know why? Because you have this tzaddikim that can save all of you. Same thing, we have a rule. When someone died, and back in the time the Torah described, they found a body. Did you hear what happened today in Israel? You know how in Israel you, have the, you send the suitcases on a plane, and then you wait, and then sometimes you see boxes, the people send boxes. Someone shipped from Europe, a box to Israel, and when they open up the bus there, the security, they found a dead body. <laughs> They're calling to ask what's his name. <laughs> Imagine that. Someone shipped a dead body. I don't know how, how it didn't smell. I really don't know. Maybe it's freezing there, the weather. Whatever the case is. <coughs> Never heard such thing. Who would have the guts to send the box with a dead body? I, I, I was trying to think to myself, what was the purpose behind it? What person would send the box with a dead body to Israel, and what's the reason for it? Ah, so now we go into another sugiya in, uh, in Judaism. If when a person dies, it's mitzvah to be buried in Israel. Or it doesn't really matter. So the answer is, depend who you ask. If you go according to the Kabbalah, to the Zohar, not only it's not a mitzvah, it's a sin to take a body of a dead person and send him to be buried in Israel, according to Kabbalah. Why? Because there is a verse, do not impurify my land. And dead body is non-pure. Sending dead bodies to Israel, making the country not as pure as it was. But Baruch Hashem, it's not the law. So if you still have a dream one day to be buried in Israel, Baruch Hashem, the law is, El Al is taking bodies to Israel every day. 
But sometimes, you know, Kohanim, when they, before they get on a flight, they check if there's a body over there or not. Not only that, even if the airplane flies, they have to know in advance the, the way that they go, if they go above a cemetery. Maybe they go above a Jewish cemetery. Right here in Main Street in Queens, you have a Jewish cemetery. If the flight takes from JFK, if it goes about this Jewish cemetery, which is very logical, a few Jewish cemeteries around. If it goes around above them, if someone is a Kohen on a flight, it goes, the impurity goes all the way up with no boundaries. Then the Kohen actually is like entering a cemetery. So what do they do? They have a special bag, some of the Kohanim. Do you hear about it? They have a special bag that they get inside for the whole flight. This you can do only in Elal. Let's see you doing it in Swiss airline. <laughs> what would happen over there? In Elal, they tolerate everything. Why? They understand what's happening. People stand, they pray in the back, fill in, block the bathroom. By the way, you should know that the people that pray in the back and get the secular people angry, their prayer is not a mitzvah. It's an avera, not a prayer, not mitzvah. If they ask permission, which is not realistic, and everyone is agreed, no problem, we'll sit one hour without going to the bathroom until you finish your tefillat shachrit, you're blocking the way, and especially when it's all Hasidish men or whatever, or Litvish, and they're all like this with the hats and the beard, and one woman wants to go, she cannot go. It's blocked completely. It's 30 people there or more. So making a mitzvah while you're actually committing an avera, canceling the mitzvah. Mitzvah, ba, ba, avera, ina mitzvah. If you take money of your friend and give it to a poor person, this mitzvah, it's not mitzvah. As you're giving it to him, you have an obligation to return it to the original owner. It's the same second. So therefore, the sin canceling the mitzvah, if they are in the same second, if the sin is now and the mitzvah is later or the other way around, one does not erase the other. But if both of them are done in the same second, the mitzvah is getting canceled with the actual sin. And therefore, if you make people upset, for instance, I'll give you an example. Let's say you come to shul and you scream for no reason. Ta -da, making noise and the person next to you cannot focus. If he doesn't care that you make noise, as long as he did not say anything, you have to assume he's okay with that. But if he asks you, excuse me, can you lower your voice? Excuse me, can you lower your voice? And you continue to ignore him. So you actually praying to Hashem, I need your help. At the same time, another Jew, because of you, could not pray. So what mitzvah is this? It's not a mitzvah. But I'll tell you something better. You know, this Hasidim, they call stolen. You heard about it? Stolen Hasidim? Stolen Hasidim, you stolen, so you can confirm if I say the truth or not. By stolen, they like to scream. When they pray, they like to be loud. They scream, they pray serious. So as long as it's all stolen Hasidim in one place, everyone is happy because they all scream. What happens if you take a stolen Hasid to a Litvish minion, a German Yeke minion? Everyone. Then he comes. Ashash All the doctors look around, the lawyers, you know. Well, so it happened one time. It really happened in reality. I don't know if it was stolen. One Hasid went to Yekeshul and he started to go loud and loud and he moves. Then the person next to him says, Excuse me, don't you see you disturbing people around you? So he looked at him, he said, what's the problem? He said, why are you so loud? So what happened? The Hasid took his hand and gave him pow, and smack in his face. <laughs> this guy was in shock. Pow. So he screamed, Ay! <laughs> <laughs> so the Hasid asked him, tell me, why did you just scream so loud? So what do you mean? You hurt me. He so said, you see, when it hurts, you scream. <laughs> you have millions of dollars in your account, no problem. The mortgage automatically is deducted. You don't even know. I have tomorrow eviction. 
11 kids, they put me on the street. I have to scream. If not, tomorrow I'll be on the street. December. You go back to your mansion, the maid come. Hello, Mr. Horowitz. Can I take your jacket? Yes. Thank you. No, the stack is ready. The stack. Hey, uh, uh, hello. I, Alex, did you take my Lexus for dry clean today? They cleaned it. This is a different lifestyle. We fight for struggle now, all day Torah, Torah, Torah. Maybe, you know, we're going to have what to eat tomorrow. <laughs> when it starts, you scream. That's, by the way, one of the things we have to do. Why is the names of the Arab is Ishmael? Ishmael, Hashem Ishma. Hashem would hear. Ishmael means that when they get us so many problems, we will scream so much to Hashem until Hashem will hear, will listen. Same thing the Egyptians did to us. So anyway, we conclude what I just said. To be a real tzaddik means that you influence the place. Not just sitting all day in a corner and nobody knows who you are and you don't influence the world. Of course, I'm not saying halacha. I'm just reading what Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch said. Some disagree with that. Every coin has two sides. Speaking about coins, today I found the coin that the Lubavitcher Rebbe gave me 25 years ago, silver coin, very unique. I was looking all around, my little kid found it. I still don't know where he found it, because he found it last night, I saw it today on my desk. So we, I have to still ask him where he found it. But that's a very, you know, the, 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 Hasid, the Chabad Hasidim, they'll kill for that coin. Because dollars, a lot of people have. But this coin, he gave it in a very rare occasion, to the best of my knowledge. OK, let's move on. So Vayan Avraham Vayomer, and Hashem answered, Avraham answered, Hine na walti ledaber el Hashem, v'anokhi afar va'efer. With your permission, Hashem, I will allow myself to speak to you with your permission. And I know that I am afar va'efer. What's, what's the difference between afar with ayin and efer with aleph? Sound almost the same. Afar means sand, efer means ashes. Who can tell me what's the difference between them? Do you think Avram just say words? What, was he a songwriter, thinking which word I should use? It obviously has a difference, and it has a depth in it. Why Avram? Avram could say, I'm nothing. I know I'm nothing. Finished. Nothing, it's nothing. David HaMelech say, Anochi tola'at velo ish. I'm a worm and not a human being. I look at myself as a worm. What's a worm? Worthless on the street, barely moving. <laughs> All day, move one meter. You know, what? what's a worm? Moshe and Aaron say, Venachnu ma, and we are nothing. Here you go, we are nothing. But Abraham Avinu used a different expression. He say, "Va'anochi afar va'efer." Maybe you should just say, "Anochi afar." I'm sand on the ground, but people walk over it. You can say, "I'm ashes." Why do you need to say "afar" and "efer"? Some kind of a secret here. What is the difference, the significance between "afar" and "efer"? Sand to ashes. So the answer is. The answer is like this. Rashi says, Avraham is mentioning the kindness of Hashem in two occasions prior to that. When Hashem saved him from a certain death. And this is his words. I was supposed to be sent by the kings when I fought the four kings. When, you know, when I, they were much, much greater than me. And I was supposed to become sent, but Baruch Hashem, you saved me. And Efer, ashes, I was supposed to be ashes by Nimrod, who threw me into the furnace. He threw me into the furnace. And therefore, it's, you obviously made a miracle for me that I'm not ashes. Rav Yonatan Eivshitz, 200 years ago in Prague, was a super genius. They say that a lot of stories about him, that since he was a kid, he was extremely genius. One time, he was walking on the street, and a goy came to him and started hitting him. He saw a Jew, 
That's how it used to be. A guy see a Jew, he's angry, he takes the Jew and hit him. So as he's hitting the Jew, Rav Yonatan Eifshitz was a kid. He took the money that he had in his pocket and he gave it to him. Here. Here, Vladimir, have it. <laughs> so the guy got it. <laughs> the guy took it. He said, why are you giving me your money, you fool? I'm hitting you. He said, we have a holiday today, the Jews, that every guy that hits us today, you must give him all the money you have. <laughs> so the guy said, OK, OK, I, I, thank you for the money. Go, go, I'll let you go. So this guy said, man, I'm going after a little kid. I better find a real rich Jew. <laughs> so here comes the Jew with a nice carriage. <laughs> carriage, horses. He didn't know there's two bodyguards also inside because there's a lot of cash. Lots of gold, cash. So there's two bodyguards over there. So he see the Jew from the window, he grab him from the window, grab him outside, begin to kick him. The two bodyguards came out and started to hit him, broke all his bones. So they brought him to court now for attacking the Gvir. So the judge said to him, what did you do? What do you think you're doing? He said, this kid told me that everyone you hit today gives you all his, all his money. <laughs> this was Rav Yonatan Eivshitz. That was very, very smart. So now, now you know, one time there's another story with him. One, he was learning with another rabbi that he was redhead. Redhead. What's special about people with redhead? They have had blood. The blood is boiling inside. It cooked the hair. It became red. <laughs> <laughs> One guy said to his daughter, I want to make sure you promise me before I die that you will never get married to a gingy. Gingy in Israel means redhead. And not to a bald guy. <laughs> so she said, gingy, I got. But why not bald guy? So maybe he used to be gingy before. <laughs> so, so he was learning with a, with a hot blood person. And right next to them, they built a church. They built a church across the street from the shul. And when they build the church, what's the first thing they do? They put a big cross over there like this, in front of his face, the gingy. Every day he pick up his eyes, he sees it in front of his eyes. So he say, I have to put an end to it. We cannot go on like this with this idol here in front of my eyes. Tonight, I'm going to cut it. I'll climb on a, on a roof of the church, and I cut it. But the, but the Christians, they already knew that it's just a matter of time until the Jews come to do it. So they put someone, few people there every night to wait. Just when he comes at night, he comes quickly with the sword. The Christian jumped with the sack, put it on his head, hit him, and brought him down to the, to the basement of the church. KJB, you know, now they take care of him. Every day they hit him, this, that. So while he's there, while he's there, you know, nobody knows where he is. So Rav Yonatan Eivshitz, he knows, he knows exactly what happened. He probably, where the, the one, he's wondering where they hit him. So this, uh, this uh, church had one, one guard over there. You know, the servant over there is taking care of the place, janitor. So what happened? The, the Christians say, we capture one of your people from the yeshiva. If you want him back, you have to give us 100,000 rubles. Uh, it's like $100,000 today. We give you a week to collect if you want him back. So in the meantime, in the meantime, no, so the way there was, the Christian didn't publish it. The guard of the place came to the Jews. He said, I know where your Jew is hidden. If you get me 100,000 rubles, I'm going to release him. This is the bribe I want to save the life of your friend before they kill him. They plan to kill him. You have a few days, get the money. So all the people went, they collect to collect, they're running, collecting, collecting. Rav Yonatan Eivshit said, what if they're not going to collect? Let me take all the nedunia, all the money that my wife has in a safe. I'll take it all out, and I'll redeem him. And when they come, they come. But in the meantime, there's no time to waste. So he took all his wife, money, jewelry, everything. 
And he came to this guy and he said to him, here, it's all here, it's even more than that. You have diamonds here, you have gold, you have, uh, and cash. Just get, get, get him out. So this guy, he opened his handcuffs, everything, and he ran, he said, make sure you, you smuggle him out of town, that nobody sees him. So they, they send him somewhere that they won't know where he is. In the meantime, these Christians knew that who would do such thing? It has to be him. So they called him, they started to hit him. He confessed that he released the Jew. So they said to him, in three days you have a trial, and based on what we know, you're going to die. So Rav Yonatan Eifschitz, after he gave all the money, he said, how am I going to explain to my wife that I gave all her jewelry and all the money? She's going to kill me. What should I do? When your wife is angry at you, what's the best thing to do? <laughs> huh? You go away on a business trip for a week. <laughs> by, the time, by the time you come back, she already forgot about the case. Otherwise, you're dead. So what happened? He went away for a few days. After a week, he's coming back home. <laughs> it's worry. When, he, when she opens the door, he was ready to get a punch. She said, oh, my dear loved husband. Whoa, where have you been? I'm looking for you for a week to give you the great news. So he said, what great news? He's wondering. She said, come, come. Look how much Hashem loves us, especially you. Come, come. So she takes him in, he, she shows him a barrel like this, huge, full of jewelry, cash, diamonds, 100 times more than what he gave. So he said, where did this come from? She said, you took all my jewelry, all my money, you gave it to this janitor across the street. In the meantime, they caught him, but he was a very big thief, this guy. Over the years, from everyone that comes to the church, it's still a ring, still a, a necklace, still cash, still. So he had a barrel of <laughs> jewelry and cash. When he found out that they're going to kill him, he's one of the, you know, so he doesn't have any family, anyone. So he knocked on my door. He said, listen, tomorrow they're going to kill me. And I was thinking, who should I give all this? And the only person I think deserves to get it is your husband. He cared about his friend so much. He paid all the money from your jewelry. This is a man that deserves this. Otherwise, who would I give it to his murderers? It's all a gift. When I die, say to your husband, the holy man, to pray for my soul. <laughs> so now this is a story. The question is, what was Rav Yonatan Eibschitz was supposed to do? What should have been his reaction? What do you think? Huh? Should he be happy? Should he be dancing? Should he be crying and thanking Hashem? Should he run on the street and scream? Huh? What should he have done? He fell on the floor and started to cry. He was crying. Oi, oi. She said to him, are you normal? Now you're crying? You should have cried when you gave my jewelry. <laughs> Why are you crying now? I will become millionaires. He said to her, it's not a good sign. Hashem paid me right away in my life. That's not a good thing. She said, what do you care when he paid you? As long as he did, he did pay, no? He said to her, no, no, no. If the mitzvah is good and Hashem is happy from it, he doesn't give you in this temporary world a bone, take it and be quiet. No. The reward in the next world is endless. It's eternal. The fact that Hashem gave it to me in this world, that's, that's a sign that Hashem was not happy from what I did. So she asked him, why? You redeemed the prisoner. It's a big mitzvah. Pidyon Shvuim. What's wrong with what you did? He said, no. I was greedy. I did it alone. I sent all the people. They're running. They're collecting. He's bringing. He's... I didn't wait for them. I sent them to collect. You know, I saw that they're not coming back. I started to get nervous. I went and did the whole mitzvah by myself. I should have let them also participate in the mitzvah. That's, by the way, explain why in 21 years that I do Kiruv, almost all the donations for my CDs came from the ordinary, simple people. It doesn't come from the billionaires. 
It doesn't come from the tycoons. It doesn't come. One, one billionaire could have given millions of CDs. It's nothing for him. But it doesn't come from these people. It's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. I give you, an, I tell you a story. I have my son, 13, is in a class in yeshiva with a boy. The father of that boy is one of the richest Jews in America. Very, very rich. So the son of the rich person tell my son that his father listens to me all day. In a car, everywhere, all the time he listens to me. Top. I hear it once, I hear it twice. I say, very good. Listen, listen, listen. Top. So one Friday, not this fast Friday, the Friday before, I get a call. Exactly half an hour before Shabbat. Half an hour before we have to go to the shul. One Hasidic man from Monsi. I don't know who he is. He didn't tell me even his name. He called me. He said to me, he started to talk to me about what do you think will happen in Israel? Half an hour before Shabbat. Go, go, go. This. Who do you think is the Mashiach? The, the boy that died and came back to life. Say the Mashiach is about tshuva. You sure it's not you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said oh, I'm not ready for Shabbat. This guy found the perfect timing to call. <laughs> so I keep hinting to him, uh, you know, I have this Shabbat soon. And he's talking and talking. So then he said to me, I want to help your Kiruv. Do you have anything for me to do? Can I drive you? Can I do this? Can I, do? I said, no, no, I don't need a driver. I don't need nothing. But yes, you still need something. I said, the only thing I need is money for CDs. The more money I have, the more people I save. That's it, nothing else. I don't have secretaries, no building, no mortgages. I don't waste a penny on anything, just CDs. So he said to me, well, money I cannot really offer you. I live from this, from that, basically from donations. I said, no problem, have a nice day, Shabbat Shalom. So wait, wait, but I have this billionaire that I know him, and I went to him a few times, and he gave me help. I, why don't you go to him? I said, I just don't go to people. I don't go, I knock, hello, my name is such and such. I came to collect money, I don't do it. So the conversation ends. What this Hasid did, he called him on his own, without telling me. Sunday, I get a call. An Ashkenazi rabbi, hello, Rabbi Mizrahi, yes. Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem, we love very much to listen to you, da, 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 da. okay, no, we get to the point. He says, so what can we do for you? So I say, who, who, who is speaking? I'm the Gabbai of Mr. X. Gabbai, meaning he doesn't, want to, he doesn't have time to write the checks and to meet people, he assigned a person for that. You want a donation? Go to him. So I, I don't even have an idea what is it about. He didn't tell me the Hasid is going to make a meeting. So I said to him, uh, I don't know, why, about what? He said, but you, you, you know, you, you, you wanted us to meet with Mr. Ding, no, for help, for donation. I said, no, no, but I, know, I think I know who, who organized it, someone that spoke to me, okay. So I said, you know, I'm doing Kiruv. So he said to me, oh, if I, if I would be you, I wouldn't waste your time. I said, why? <laughs> now I know already for my son, that he listens all day to the CDs and he loves them. He said, because he has a rule. What's his rule? I give you one guess. What's the rule? I don't know if to cry or to laugh when I will tell you this, but you decide what you want to do. What's his rule? One guess. Huh? No, no money to rabbis. No, he gives tons of money to rabbis. Tons of money to yeshivot he gives. I'm telling you, he's one of the generous gvirim. We are not here to talk bad about him because he's, he's giving tons of donations. Don't worry about him. I just want to show you how it works when it comes to Kiruv. The rule is he doesn't give anything for Kiruv. <laughs> the best investment by far than anything else, everything he gives except this. Now, if you think it's only him, it's all the billionaires like this. They have the same rule, they answer the same answer. Who puts in their mind not to invest in Kiruv, which is the best investment? Hashem, I guess, wants the Kiruv to come from the ordinary people, to give as many people a, a merit in this mitzvah. Otherwise, do you have any other explanation for it? Again, we're not talking about cheap people. 
If it's someone billionaire that never gives tzedakah to anyone, no, what's the surprise here? There's no surprise. But if it's someone who gives a lot, a lot, checks, 20,000, 30,000, 18,000, to a lot of institutions, why wouldn't he give to Kiru? That's a good point. I asked one rabbi on my way here, we spoke on the phone, he told me you didn't get the point. So I want to tell you the other side of the coin. He said, it's not that he, if you would, he, when he think Kiru in his mind, he think big organization, buildings, lots of workers, cars, rentals, seminars, hotels, 80% of the money goes to the garbage. He rather give it to different places. It's not the same, like by you, you have to explain to him that it goes only for the CDs. Whatever he gives, put his father's name who passed away on the CDs, show him, you see, here, take a picture, show him, we made 3,000 CDs, 5,000 CDs for the merit of your father, and that's where all the money went to. Nothing else, no building, no that. You'll see he's gonna give. We will see. To be continued. <laughs> <laughs> How did we get to it? So Rav Yonatan Ivishitz. Now we have to understand what does it mean, Vanochi Afar Vaefer. Vanochi Afar Vaefer. So he says, what's the difference? Look what a genius thought he had. What's the difference between Afar and Efer? Sand to ashes. The sand, the ashes is proud of his past. The ashes, the sand is proud of his future. You got the point or not? The ashes, it used to be a nice cabinet or a nice table or a nice house. Once it got burned and turned into ashes, the ashes can only remember what I used to be. Meaning I'm proud about my past. But the sand right now is raw material. But there's nothing that you can build without sand today. You need to build homes, the glass is made from sand. A lot of things is made from sand. You need it for construction. Meaning the sand is proud of his future. So Abraham Avinu is saying to Hashem, I am nothing based on my, what I already achieved, and I'm still nothing based on what I'm going to achieve. Doesn't matter how great I'm going to be, even I'll get a hundred times bigger at Sadiq than what I am now, I know I will always be nothing. That's a real humble person. Some people are humble because they have nothing in life. No money, no wisdom, no look, no health, no nothing. So what are exactly they're going to be proud of? One of the Rebbe went to visit his son in Yeshiva. So he came to Yeshiva and he saw one boy, teenager, and all the boys of the Yeshiva are around him. So he asked his son, this Rebbe, what's special about this Bachor there that everyone is like magnet to him? So he said to him, he is humble. He's humble. He's not proud. He's not a show off. So the Rebbe asked the father, the son, why? Is he a big Talmud Chacham? Is he a genius in Torah? He said, no. So he said, is he a son of a very rich man? He said, no, ordinary family. He said, he has any specific unique talent? He said, no. So the father said, so what, what does he have to be proud of? I don't get it. If he's a big giant hacham or some, someone very rich or the best singer in the world or an, I don't know what, somebody that has something to be proud of and he's humble, no, he deserves appreciation. But if he's zero, in everything zero, 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 zero until tomorrow, what exactly is going to be proud of? Good point or not? Huh? <sighs> Technically and logically, it's a very good point. But when the Rosh Yeshiva came, he disagreed with that Rebbe. He told him the other way around, right? He said the less talents the person has, the less wisdom, the less look, the less talents, the less everything he has, he has a bigger urge to be a proud person. That's not, 
logically right. You're a genius, you want to show it off. You're very pretty, you want to show it. But in today's world, look, at, look around. People that have really nothing to show, they still want to show. People that have nothing to say, talk non-stop. All the big giants, Chachamim, don't say a word. Not a word. Chacham ben Zion Abba Shaul, the biggest Chacham in the world. In Pshat, in Gemara, in Kabbalah, in Halacha, in everything. In Kabbalah also. Not a word. You sit next to him three hours arguing about the subject. In one second he can finish the argument. He can tell you you're wrong and you're right and this is the source. Go and check. End of story. Doesn't push his nose. He doesn't talk unless you talk to him. Doesn't push his nose to people's business. When someone talks, he let him talk. Doesn't break into his words. That's one of the signs of chokhmah, of wisdom. That you're able to hear the other person. Because most of the people in today's world, they don't have patience to let him say a word right away. Let him finish the sentence. Maybe he's going to a different direction. Now, let's talk a little bit about one of the most substantial events in the history. Who knows what it is? Very good. Akedat Yitzchak. In case you didn't know, Yitzchak was born to Avram and Sarah when Avram was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old. 90 years old. They were married for 50 years without kids, until Hashem said to Avram Avinu, Lech Lecha, go away from the place where you live to, a no, to another place I will show you. Lech Lecha is hinting to him that when he will be 100 years old, he will have a child. Lech, Lech Lecha, Lech, it's 50 numeric value, Lamed it's 30, Chaf it's 20, Lecha it's also Lamed Chaf, 50 plus 50, 100. So he's already hinting to him, you are 75 now, leave the place, go to a new place, Meshane Mako, Meshane Mazal. One of the things that a person should do when his life is a mess, he tries, he keeps mitzvot, he does everything, no blessing in his life, no mazal. One of the things to do is to change the name, to add a name. Maybe the name brings bad mazal to your life. One of the things to do is, to change the location. What's the location has to do with, the, with what's around you? You're righteous or wicked? There are many things. Sometimes the house itself is cursed. Maybe someone that lives before you over there was Mr. Lee from China. All day bow down to his gechkes, <laughs> to his idols. Such a curse in this place. Now you pay the price, you live there. Maybe you didn't do Hanukkah by it. Maybe it's not the tikkun of your neshama in this place. So many things. It can be so many things. You know, one of the things is announced before you're born is who's going to be your husband or wife. But not that many people also know that your residence is also announced. Where are you going to live? It's no coincidence that you come to live in a place. So many times Hashem directs you to the place He wants you right there. Exactly there. So now, in Rosh Hashanah, which is the Judgment Day, when we read in the Torah, which part we read? Vashem pakad et Sarah, and Hashem made Sarah pregnant, and after that, the second reading, Akedat Yitzchak, taking Yitzchak to Ara Muria. Okay, now, some people say, Rabbi, we don't really choose. We are robots, Hashem already decided for us everything, Hashem knows the future, therefore we, there's no way that we can actually choose anything. And the answer to those fools is, if that was the case, how would you explain this verse? Vayi achar advarim ha'ele, vayelokim nisa et Avraham. After those things, Hashem came to test Abraham. How do you test a person to see what he's going to do? You give him a test. If a person is a robot, he doesn't choose where to go, to do the right thing, to answer the right, to answer wrong. He's a robot. A robot doesn't have a choice. 
So obviously you see over here that Hashem is testing Abraham to see if he's going to be righteous or wicked. How many tests Hashem tested Abraham? Ten. This was which one out of the ten? Which one was this? The tenth one. And once he finished and passed this test, what did the Torah say? Ata yadati ki kimata. Now I know that you are fearful from God. What does it mean? What is this? Well, you didn't know before. You know the future. Hashem behaves with us and speaks to us in a language of human being. Of course Hashem knows the future, but He ignores what He knows. He can travel into the future and see the, the final results, of course. But He doesn't go there. Why? Because right now He puts a test in front of you. You can choose good or you can choose bad and it's 100% in your hand. Other than that, nothing else is in your hand. If you be handsome or not, it's not in your hand. If you be short or tall, not in your hand. You be rich or poor, some people kill themselves, they're poor. Some people do nothing, they're rich. If you be wise or not, it's not every, nothing is in your hand. Who your parents are, a man or woman, sick or healthy, most of these things, are, nothing is in your hands, except one thing, in Hashanah. If you have fear from God to be righteous or not, Fear from God is 100% in your hand. Everything else is not in your hand. You can kill yourself day and night, one day after the other, and you still don't have what you want because Hashem determined for you what's going to be with you. But there's only one thing you can change in any given moment. Now I'm, I'm wicked, the next minute I want to be righteous, and that's it. I had it. I'm not going to repeat these mistakes anymore. I'm going to read to you something very interesting that I found today. I read it to you. That Hashem said to Abraham, Now I know you fearful from God. Listen to this. We're speaking about irat onesh. Fear from the punishment. It says like this. Ve'af ki ha'oved et Hashem me'ahava. Even so, even though a person serve Hashem out of love. Right? Word by word I'm reading to you. Gadol me'ahoved mi'ira. It's greater than someone who serves Hashem out of fear. Where does it say it? In the Gemara, in Masechet Sota, page 31. In the Gemara. Mikol makom, bishvi leagia leahava, chayavim kodem ira. Anyhow, to reach a level of serving Hashem with love, you must first reach a level of ira first. That you have fear to make sins, fear from the punishment, fear to be wicked. Kayadua bedivrei hazoar. Where did I say it to you from? Zoar parashat vayakel. And bilshon chasidim murgal, the language of the chasidim. They say the words of the Tzaddik Rabbi Aaron Mikerlin. Rabbi Aaron Mikerlin is a famous Rebbe. Ira belo ahava ena shlemut. Fear without love, it's not, it's incomplete. Ahava belo ira ena velo klum. Love without fear, it's gurnished. It's not even something, nothing. How many years I yelled this until I found it today? My, my heart came out. Baruch Hashem. I, I have other sources I was using, but this is sweeter than honey. Sweeter than honey. How many times, how many years I screamed that and some criticizer said, no, has to be from love. 
There's no such thing, love. Enough with the illusions. The love can only come after you first fix yourself and you shake before you make a scene. Now you have time to begin to fall in love with Hashem. Everything else is an illusion. This is what he says. He says clearly, love, fear without love, it's incomplete. Meaning it's something, but it's not perfect. Okay? Love without fear, it's nothing. Zero. Why? Why? How many times you really met in your life a person that is so in love with Hashem, so in love with Him, that all day is talking to Him, praying to Him, crying to Him, nothing else in His life. Nothing. No food, no sport, no shopping, no nothing. There's no way to make it a scene. Nothing. A call out of love. No fear, nothing, he doesn't care, punishment, no punishment. 1,000% devotion, emotion, every little thing that Hashem does for him, tears of happiness. Did a person, some of you probably fell in love in your life. So when a person loves a woman or a woman loves a man, from the minute that the love becomes strong in the heart, in the mind, you have to understand, for those of you who never know, know what it is, that after the, you reach that moment, everything else in your life is almost nothing. You don't care. You don't care about work. You don't care about this. You don't care about that. Why? Because your mind is, and your heart is so taken by the love that you feel that nothing else you care about. Who said it? Who? What I just said. The Rambam, the greatest Rambam. What do you think, the Chachamim didn't know what love is? The Rambam say the love of a man to Hashem should be like a love of a man to his woman that thinks about her all day and nothing else and all day is thinking when he's going to see her and what is she going to say and what does she love if she's going to buy her something will she like it will this and that all his life is thinking about it the romantic one. this is how he has to think about Hashem will Hashem love that I run to save this Jew will Hashem love that I'll kill myself six hours to understand this Gemara how do I make Hashem happy so the Rambam said but how do you reach such level your woman, you see who she is. You love her, you don't love her. Finished. You know what you have. It's in front of your eyes. Hashem, it's a mystery. How you fall in love with a mystery? First of all, it's very possible because many people fell in love with someone over the phone. And then in the end, it was all an illusion. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> That's one thing. Second... Second, how do you really fall in love with Hashem? You look at things around you, what he did, how he does, how he ran the world, how he made everything with colors, with beauty. All the things that it's mandatory to do, Hashem put pleasure in it. Why? I have to eat. If I don't eat, I die. Why does it have to taste 5,000 different flavors? Why, well, it couldn't be all taste like mud, like the snake? Everything he eats like, like sand. Well, then, one taste. One taste. Everything you eat, bitter. Everything you eat, salty. But he gives you this pleasure, spicy, sweet, hot and sour, sour, hot, this, that. Why did he have to make colors in the food? Red, green, yellow. Why? It attracts the person, he enjoys. That's why they say a blind person doesn't enjoy the meal. He tastes flavors, but he doesn't see it, he doesn't enjoy it. It's missing, the, the pleasure is missing. Why did I, a person wants to have kids? He, it's mandatory. He needs to have kids, he needs a wife for it. Why did it have to come through pleasure? It could have been, you come to your wife, press on her nose, and that's it, she's my name, ma. Hold it down 20 seconds, finished. Why did Hashem make it like this? The answer is that this world was not given to suffer like some fool's things. No problem. Enjoy while it's permitted and kosher. 
The Gemara says, everything Hashem says it's not allowed, He gives you a substitute. To go with women like an animal, that's not allowed. You have one, it's allowed. Pork, delicious. See how the Russian people love pork? Not you. <laughs> you know Vladimir and his friends. Oh, they see pork all day, chazir, pork, this, one. Jew is not allowed to touch chazir, man. I cannot eat chazir. What did Hashem do? He made a fish that exactly like pig, like pork. Shibuta. Shibuta. I don't know the American names of it. Maybe it has a Christopoulos, some kind of an... I don't know the name in, in English, but it's called Shibuta. Tastes exactly like pork, without a sin. The Gemara gives a list of things. This is not allowed, here it's allowed. Even his own wife, two weeks, two and a half weeks allowed, 10 days, 12 days not allowed. Always like this, on and off. It's, it's all about timing, it's all about education, it's all about training. You're not an animal, control your desires, that's all. I don't mind that when it's permitted that you enjoy. Loose, loose up a little bit. Now, finish. Time to work on yourself. Now, is tight, is tight. Why? This is all about training. Sometimes mitzvah to be tough. Sometimes they have to be soft. Sometimes they have mitzvah to be extra generous. Sometimes mitzvah now not to give too much. Depend who, depend when, depend why. So the Akedah of Yitzchak, Hashem loves Avraham very much. Hashem said to Avraham, look at all these goyim. They take their babies, they throw them to the fire, to their idols. I want you to go and teach them that that's not, not, that's not what I want. I don't want, I don't give you a baby to take him and throw him to the fire. Teach. So Avraham is preaching to the goyim. He has a lot of money. He's like wealthier than Donald Trump. So people pay, you know, pay attention to you. If you're rich, people listen to you. you don't, you're not rich, who's gonna... They say that uh, Kohen Gadol has to be rich. People have to give him a lot of money. Or Dayanim, the judges. Or king, they have to give him a lot of money. Why? Because when you're in authority, the only way the rich people would accept from you orders is when you're just as rich as them. That reminds me always when I say this, that about uh, maybe 12, 13 years ago, one guy, young guy, he calls me up, it was Chola Moet Sukkot, I remember this, I was standing in the grass in my backyard, and he called me up, he said, I want you to come and give a lecture in my neighborhood. His neighborhood is a fancy neighborhood. So he said to me, I want to start a program. I'm going to get a sponsor. I already have a sponsor. We're going to buy food. We bring all the young people. They're all going to come and they do tshuva. And Baruch Hashem, you're the right person for the job. Would you do it? I said, of course. OK, so we started. We made a date. OK. Now, when the first time I came, I came with an ordinary suit. So then he said to me, no offense, Rabbi. <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but listen to this. He said, I want to take you to Woodbury Common over there. Over there, I want to buy you five suits. It's $2,000 each. Over there, it's a reduced price. Don't worry about it. I'll buy you five nice fancy suits. And please do me a favor. After that, when you come with your car, don't park it near the place. <laughs> <laughs> and back away <laughs> and could just walk in, but come with those suits. I said, what's wrong with my suit? Ma, it's not, no, it's <laughs> So he said to me, no, no, you don't understand how these people think. Each one of these people worth 50 million, 100 million, 500 million, they're very rich people. First thing they check when they see someone that come to preach to them, if he's high class like them or not. If he's high class like them, $500 shoes, $2,000 suit, $20,000 watch, $100,000 car, they look at him like the Mashiach arrived. <laughs> if they see him come with a little Toyota, $200 suit, $200 watch, whatever you say, you talk to the world. What do you think? 
He said what he said. He didn't know that he aimed to the walls of the Gemara. The Gemara says someone that is rich, Dvarav Nishmaim. Why? Because you Donald Trump, you claim that you have $9 billion. If he would lose all his money, somebody would let him say one word, Bechlal? They shut the microphone in the middle. <laughs> your time is up. Why? We just heard your crash, your company crash, your bankrupt. Shut it, or let me finish at least the speech. <laughs> the battery finished. They say, Nibru Bala Mea, Ubala Dea. The owner of the hundred, hundred dollar bill, is the owner of the opinions. Why? Once you have the money, you can tell people what to do. This is what's happening today in our communities. The rabbis usually are not billionaires. You're usually also not millionaires. So what happened? They have a board, board of directors of the shul. Sometimes they build the shul, sometimes they run the shul, sometimes they raise the money. They determine to the rabbi what to do in the shul. The rabbi is a nice picture on the wall. Nice picture. One day they put it here, one day they put him here, one day they say quiet, one day they sit over here, one day they say, when you speak, be careful not to talk about modesty. Why, the wife of one of the board members came with her high heels and mini skirt today. They don't want to get him angry. Maybe he's going to cut his help to the shul and the shul will go bankrupt. And that's what actually took the shuls and turned them into a club. It's not a shul anymore. If the rabbi runs the shul and he's the Mara de Atra, he's the, the opinion, and all the rich people brings the money and support, but they say, yes, Chacham, yes, rabbi, nobody ever pushes nose to religion, only to the maintenance and stuff, wonderful, but usually you never find it. There's always at least one rasha that sits there and he decides, and he's angry, and he's proud, and things that he doesn't like, he, he fights and he doesn't let. Until the rabbi call and apologize. I'm so sorry, I wish I could do something. What can he do? There's nothing he can do. They control him. And this is what's happening today. So now HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to Abraham Avinu. After giving him such speech that it's not good to kill your kids, he says, go and kill your son. After he waited for the son, 75 years. Now what happened? Age 100, he has to take him to kill him. Did he have the right to ask Hashem, excuse me, one thing I don't understand. You have been saying all alone that it's not good to kill the kids, and now you're telling me to kill the innocent kid. Can you at least explain to me according to, to your mind why? I'm going to do it, of course, but why? Not one word he said. Not one argument he said. Not one problem. Not only that, he woke up very early in the morning before rush hour and ran to the Moriah mountain. Two mountains are very significant in the Jewish history. Which one those two, which mountains? <laughs> Har Sinai and Har Moriah. Moriah mountain and Sinai mountain. Which one of the two the Torah was given on? Why not on Hara Moria? Huh? Har Sinai Chazal say was the lowest mountain. To show you Torah, if you want to be a Chacham, you have to be extremely humble. Proud have a limit to how much Torah they will have. The second question is, from all, from the two mountains, which one had the merit to have Bet HaMikdash? The temple, Har Moria. Why? Why the, the temple was built in the Moriah mountain? That's where the Yaakov saw the angel going up and down. But before Yaakov, the merit is Avraham Avinu that took his son without asking one question 
and was ready to slaughter him. And when the angel told him, don't touch him, he <clears throat> begged him, let me at least cut. Let me choke him. Let me cut him. Do something. I came all the way for the mitzvah. Who would do such thing? I want to ask you one question. It says in the Torah, you know, what's written, written. That's it. You don't need Rashi for that. It's written. It says, Avraham He woke up early in the morning, meaning he went to sleep. I have a flight in the morning. I cannot fall asleep all night. Forget about slaughtering the sun after a hundred years of wait. <laughs> Flights. Wow, Akshav, by mistake, I won't wake up. I miss the flight, people waiting, seminar, this, that. They, it's a nightmare. It's, 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 you know, very scary. He has to go and kill his son after a hundred years he waited for him. <sighs> Snores and dead. How can it be? Do you know one person in the world? One, one, show me one. In the whole world, from maybe three and a half billion men in the world, or three billion, whatever, that you'll tell him that you have to kill your only son tomorrow morning. You know what? Even if you have 10 other sons, one of them you have to kill tomorrow morning, and he will be able to fall asleep. Usually it would be like this, standing by the terrace, one cigarette from the other. Moshe, what's happening? <laughs> or there's another way. He looks at him like this when the kid is sleeping, taking his phone. <laughs> what are you doing? You take a kid, pictures of the kid in the middle of the night. Then you wake him up, smile to the camera, selfie. Abba, why are you waking me up at 4 a.m.? What is he going to tell him? I'm going to kill you? One thing for sure, no one will be able to sleep. The level of emunah Avraham had, it's scary. What a level of emunah a person reached. But I want to ask you a question. Who deserves a bigger Yishar Koach? A bigger admiration? Avraham or Yitzchak? Technically, Yitzchak should deserve... <laughs> he could have said to him, what do you think, I'm your toy? <laughs> How old was he, you know? 37. It's not a little baby. Abba, pick me up. It's Hak. It's a man. Ma. He pushes him. What are you, crazy? You want to cut me? Get out of here. What is this murder? No, no, Hashem told me. You had an hallucination. <laughs> Leave me alone. You go to a 37 years old kid. His father is 100. Father 100 years old comes like this with his white hair, white beard. And the 37 day guy, guy all day is muscular like this. They come, son, I have to cut you. Lay down here. <laughs> what would happen? And he said, okay, tie me that I won't move. I want to ask you another question. If Hashem comes to one of us, we have a kid, and Hashem come to one of us, speaking to us directly, directly. What does it mean directly? He says, I want you to take your son and throw him from the Empire State Building and leave us. Do we have a choice? If the Baba told us, you're not my Baba anymore, right? The rabbi told you that. That's it. I'm done with you. But if Hashem comes and says to a person, I want you to do it, does, how many choices he has? If he won't do it, Hashem will do it. Yeah. You can go against Hashem? Ma. So what is the great admiration? The answer is, he didn't tell him to do it. He asked him if he's willing to do it. Kach na. It now means bevakasha, please agree to do it. Doesn't mean, in other words, he had a way out. He had solid answers to tell Hashem, I cannot do it. It's against the Torah. First, it's a murder. You said you should not kill. Second, it's against everything you taught me. No one is allowed to kill his kids for any religion, uh, uh, purpose of religion. Third, you promise me that my slave will not inherit me. It will be my own son. You're breaking your promise. You want him, you take him. No? Not one word. That's what it means. 
I have all the answers to win the argument in a minute with Hashem. He wouldn't be able to answer me because Hashem is not a liar. He knows I'm right. But the idea is I cancel my wisdom and my opinion and my rights for one word of request from you, I'm willing to die. No problem. That's why we get saved and that's why we read it in Rosh Hashanah. It was in Rosh Hashanah. And we read it on Rosh Hashanah. And we blow the shofar that comes from the aisle that was the ram that was stuck in a bush with the horns. Why? To bring mercy on us. Look who our, who our father was. He was willing to kill his son for you and you want to judge us, Chaz Shalom, to give us a punishment. So the shofar brings mercy. Why are you not allowed to cover the shofar with gold? You can cover it, gold-plated. Nice, no? Wow, bring shofar from gold, cover from gold. Tu, 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 the gold. It's very nice to hold something from gold, shiny. Why? Gold reminds the golden calf. You, now it's time that we beg for our life. You don't bring any memory of the worst things we ever did. You don't bring it into the conversation. If somebody comes to the king, he said, remember how one time I broke the face of your son? <laughs> you come to ask me for help, you remind me of what you did. So I'm doing it. In the Aftara of the Shavua, we read a similar story. The Aftara is always similar to the parasha. Why we read Aftara? Because the Romans, they made a decree that we cannot learn Torah, and therefore it was not permitted to read Torah in a public event. So the Jews couldn't read in the Torah. So they asked them, okay, the Torah we understand you don't allow, but what about to read the words of the rabbis? You care? Ah, the rabbis, we don't care. You can read as much as you want. So they said, okay, Rabbi Elisha, Rabbi Yeshaya, Rabbi Yirmiya, there's no problem to read. So, okay, so they found in the Tanakh similar subject, and they made it in the right order of the parshiot. Why? That in the future to come, when finally the decree will get canceled, so they will be able to remember which parasha we used to read this week, which one this week. Everything to have similarity. One of them is right here. In the Aftara, Elisha, the prophet, promised a boy to the Shunamit. There's a woman, Shunamit. Elisha, the prophet, comes to her. He says, in one year, you're going to have a kid, just like with Sarah. In one year, you're going to have a kid. In our parasha. In, in a book of Kings B, chapter 4, it's describing the miracle that Elisha did. Two of them is mentioned in our Aftara as we're going to read this coming Shabbat. The first miracle, the wife of Ovadia. Who was Ovadia? Not Ovadia Yosef. <laughs> huh? The wife, the wife of Ovadia the prophet, the Navi. She came to Elisha crying that her deceased husband lent money with interest from Yoram ben Achav. Yoram the son of Achav. Why? To give food for 100 prophets that he hid in the cave. How are they going to eat? There's no money, so he borrowed money. And now Yoram came to take her two sons collateral to be slaves. And Elisha asked, what do you have at home? And she said, nothing. I just have a little jar with a little bit, tiny few drops of oil left. Elisha says, go and take a lot of jars from your neighbors, bowls, jars, kettles, anything you can take. Bring it into the house, borrow it from the neighbors. While he was inside the house with her sons, once you're gonna be inside the house with your sons, fill up the, 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 the jars 
and the oil will always remain and will not finish. He gave a special, he made a special blessing that this little jar that had few drops of oil became full and all the other things. And he said to her, whenever the other jars are empty, you continue to you have basically unlimited faucet. As much as you want, you can take. Elisha told her, some of the oil you sell and pay the debt to this Rasha, and the rest will be for you to live. That was the first miracle. Second miracle, when Elisha went to Shunam, that's why they call her the Shunamit, like the New Yorker, like Tel Aviv, Batyami, Yerushalmi, come from the place where you came. In Morocco, they say El Fasi. Why El Fasi? He came from the city of Fas. In, uh, the, by the Ashkenazim, they also come based on the city where they used to live. So they, na they named the city. So people named after the city where they came from. So it says like this, that he came to the city of Shunam, and he went to a very wealthy woman, important woman. She's wealthy. And her and her husband respected him very much. And they built for him an attic that he can live there every time he comes. That's going to be a spe special room. Elisha wanted to pay them, so he blessed them with a baby boy. He blessed them with a boy. And after a while, his blessing happened. Then the boy died. After the boy was born, he went to the, to the field and he died. And Elisha prayed for him and revived him and brought him back to life. He laid on him and he brought him back to life. Two things we have to understand. Why Elisha told her, what do you have in the house? And she said, I have nothing, empty jar, one drop of oil in the bottom left. So bring it, but I will bless this. Why? 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 He could just take anything empty and bless it and fill it up. Why? It had to be something that she has. What do you have? You have any food? Bring me the food that I can bless it. Why? If you already make a miracle, what difference does it make? What kind of a miracle? The answer, you need the bracha, the blessing, lachul al something. The blessing has to be on something, even one drop. You bless it, it's going to be fine. Same thing, the Hanukkah oil. One tiny, it's enough for one day. The special miracle on something that it has an existence. Everything else is extra. The miracle of reviving the boy. This is the power of a chacham. They said that when they bury Elisha, one dead person touched his bones and came back to life. That's how holy he was. Baruch Hashem, until Mashiach comes, we won't have anyone like this level until Mashiach comes. When Mashiach comes, then the world will come back to those days. But until then, we have ordinary people, and we have to follow their instructions without searching for miracles. The Bach, the Bach of Yoel Sirkin, he is uh, one of the commentaries on Shulchan Aruch. He says, when he was a rabbi in a city of Belz, it used to be a city in Europe named Belz. Today he has Hasidut that is from people that came from Belz to America and to Israel. It's a very big building in Yerushalayim. Look bigger than the Bet HaMikdash. And always you see it on the mountain with the light. I had the merit to speak there once. I gave a lecture to the Hasidim there inside these bells over there, neighborhood. So the, Hasid, the Hasidim bells, they're well known as Mekarvim. They do Kiruv, they try to bring people into Judaism. There is a Shabbaton next month of Keraftanu, on November, second one. They did one six months ago, five months ago. Now, in a month from now, they're doing a Shabbaton, you know, in, the, in Connecticut. They doing, on this particular Shabbaton, they do Kiruv Krovim. Religious people gather them together with words of Torah and encouragement. So Rav the Bach, he lived in the city of Bells, and they did not pay him a salary. He was the biggest Chacham in town, and he was very poor. 
and he could not buy candles. Why does he need candles for? There's no electric. You need lights. Without candles, you don't have lights. So because he did not have lights, he was sitting in the darkness without books and learning Torah from his memory. His memory was very super sharp. The, 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 the scholars of Bells, the other rabbi, when they saw that his house, the house of the chief rabbi is always dark, they started to speak Lashon Ara about him. What kind of rabbi is this? Every night his house is he's snoring very good, this guy. He likes to sleep a lot. Every night he sleeps. This is a chacham. Doesn't learn. Mas. It's five o'clock, it becomes dark, he goes to bed. <laughs> the rumor in town. So they came to the conclusion that they have to fire him and get rid of him. So they did. They, they kicked him out. The people of Brisk, they appreciate Torah. They were all learners. They knew to appreciate him. When they found out that Rabbi Yoel was kicked out of Bells, they invited him to come to them and to become the rabbi of their city. Once, at the time of the decision to kick him out, he didn't know that some other people will be more than happy to accept him and give him great condition. So before he left the town, he said to the people of the community, do you know why HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? He flipped everything over. Hashem didn't have any other punishments. He had to take Sodom and flip it over, like you take a plate and flip it over with all the food spilling. He could have done many other things. Because no one could answer, obviously. So he said, because this punishment was measure for measure. Mida keneged mida. The people of Sodom, they changed the orders and the laws of nature. Everything they did, the opposite of the law of nature. Gay marriage, one woman live with two husbands, no hospitality. If somebody get, got food from one of them, they kill him. Everything the opposite of what Hashem said to do. Because they did the opposite of what Hashem said, Hashem gave them the same punishment. Flip everything up on upside down. In Sodom, in our town, that's where he was just kicked from, everything here is the opposite of what it should be. The people of the place have to worry about the parnasa of the rabbi to take care of his living. And the rabbi has to take care of the Torah learning of the people of his town. So the rabbi teach everybody Torah, that's his responsibility. And the rich people in town has to take care of his needs. Right? Because if he has to go and work in a market, when is he going to learn Torah? Where is he going to teach Torah? So he says, in this city, you will worry about the Torah of the rabbi <laughs> instead of doing your obligation. And the rabbi's job was what? To, make, to take care of his own living. <laughs> Everything was the other way around. And what happened in the end? You kicking the rabbi out because of your own crime. If you would give few dollars, whatever, rubles, to buy candles, I would be able to learn with light. Now I had to learn it in the darkness. And instead of feeling bad for what you did, now you come to fire me, and Baruch Hashem, you went to a different city, and that was the end of it. This is the way the world is. Sometimes a person ignores his obligation. Women wants to be men, men wants to be women, children wants to be adults, adults wants to be children, a Jew wants to be a goy, a goy wants to be a Jew. That's what's happening. Everyone wants to be what is not supposed to be. Everyone should stick to his personal purpose. We have a general purpose of every Jew in the world. Emuna, faith in Hashem, Shabbat, modesty, behaving, fixing the bad traits. This is a general. 
But each individual has his own purpose. One jealous person, work on your jealousy. One angry, work on your anger. One is so show off, proud, work on it. Become humble. One is so stingy. They educate him, come, come. Mr. Stingy guy, put please one quarter in the bag. I can't. Put. I can't. Try. No, please. You know how they stand around the babies when they go to the bathroom or around the woman. Push, push, put. He puts one quarter. Kadal vit kadash me rabba. He said kadish for the quarter. Then tomorrow they come, put two quarters. No, you're crazy, I didn't sleep all night. Put! Finally, put two quarters. You come three years later, walks around, Rabbi, I like your yeshiva, here, 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 here. What happened? He walked on it. You walk on your problem, Habibi. <laughs> what do you think, it goes by itself? Nobody wants to walk on their personal purpose. People want to be robots, Shabbat, Chulent, snoring in bed, <laughs> Shul, Kbak, the robots. The main thing is to work on the personal character. You have a sickness, work on it. You have a disease, work on it. You have a mental case, work on it. Everything, you, you're hungry, everything you see, you want to eat? I went, i tell you something, a story, and we'll finish with that. The books are already closed, so you can relax. Now, one minute story, and if you have questions, you better not have because then we'll stay here another hour. <laughs> so, uh, uh, today it's Tuesday, Sunday, nine days ago, I spoke to a bunch of Syrian business people here. One person bought a new place, they made like some kind of a Hanukkah bite lecture, and you know, he, he ordered the best stuff on earth. Different kinds of meat, salads, much fancy, fancy, fancy. So there were a lot of people. Before I came, they were Baruch Hashem, they it's their dinner. And I came with one Ashkenazi guy that from time to time he begs me to drive me. I said, ah, no, no, it's my fun, I want to come. So he came, we came in. Now I cannot eat because I don't, it's not in front of the people. So the rabbi is pressing, it doesn't look so good. So you don't have a choice, not because you was a tzaddik or something. But him, he can eat as much as he wants. I say to him, no, eat. Soon, soon. The whole four hours that we were there, unbelievable food. Now I don't know one person in this world that will be able to be there and not eat. He did not taste one bite from anything. Why? He works on himself. To fight desire for food. Now we're not talking somebody 400 pounds here. <laughs> Look, okay, work on his midot. Because all the people that are on diet, they always say, on, only this time. I'm in a wedding, I'm not gonna eat. I get $500 a gift. I gotta, I gotta take something in return. Tomorrow I'll, I'll renew the diet. But somehow every day they get into a fancy meal. At work, over here. It's never end. The idea is, once you make a decision, you stick to it. And you work on it, and you work on it, and you work on it. Really, nothing can stand in front of a will of a person. You work on your will, on your power of will, and you keep going and going. The sky is the limit. You can go in such level and to be free from the cords of the Satan and the Yetzirah. Because right now, every person is a prisoner of his desires. He's a prisoner of the cigarettes. He's the prisoner of the heroin. He's a prisoner of the alcohol. He's a prisoner of the women. He's a prisoner of the Gucci bags. She's a prisoner of the shoes with the high heels, 500 pairs. Everyone is a prisoner of one desire, or two, or five, or 10, or 5,000. Depend on a person. There are these women, every two days they're in a saloon. Every two days. One day her hair is like this, next day red, next day blonde, next day half and half. Out of boredness, she's bored. 
But it looks exactly the same. No, no, I have to go. I have to do my nails. One uh, pregnant woman, she sent me a message, a, a, a question. Am I, I'm in a ninth month. Am I allowed to go to Manico or Pedico? I'm thinking to myself, what's the question? What's the question? I said, why not? She said, because I, didn't, I think she's asking if she can fix her nails. So I didn't understand the question. Well, what does the nails have to do with it? But I didn't know that she now takes two, three hours of her day to go to a place that over there they'll fix her nails. But the problem is that the floor is full of nails. A pregnant woman to go over nails it could be life risk of a baby. <laughs> so I said, but you cannot do your own nails once. Once in your life, sacrifice. Be like Avraham Avinu. He sacrifices his son, you sacrifice a piece of your nail. Baruch Hashem, today she had a boy. Mazal <laughs> Tov. We'll see you next Tuesday, 8 o'clock. Shavua Tov. Kol Tov. Baruch Adonai Lo'olam. Amen ve'amen.